first thing we look at is devoted. Jesus Christ is devoted to go to the cross. That's the task at hand. That's what he came to do. The Bible says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But to them that received him, to them gave he part to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he came. And this is the time. The time has come. You remember so many times he said, my hour has not yet come. Boy, it has come. And this is the last week of his, his, of his life. And we see that he is just moments away from going to the cross. We see last week in this chapter that they celebrated the, the Passover. The last Passover. The last ordained Passover meal. Now we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And that was the first ordained Lord's Supper. Or I guess you'd say, the, yeah, the first Lord's Supper that it was instituted on that Passover meal. And he had the cups, drank the cup, and we see that. And we talked a little bit about what each cup meant. And we'll see a little we'll see some of that today. And we know that the first or the, the uh, Passover lambs were were slaughtered that day, uh, earlier in the, in the morning, and they they were they were uh, sacrificed from nine uh, in the morning all the way to three at three p.m. Jesus Christ died at three p.m. as the last Passover lamb. So everything about the Passover is depicted in uh, this week because this is a fulfillment of the <coughs> first Passover. This is the actual Passover. This is what the original Passover pointed to. <clears throat> so everything about that week, when uh, the Passover lamb on the 10th day of the month, they selected an unblemished lamb and to be inspected. They brought him into the house on the 10th and had to inspect make sure it was unblemished. And on the 14th day, the lamb was sacrificed. And on the 15th day, they observed the Passover meal. So all of that is happening. Now we know that Jesus observed the Passover, observed it with his disciples the day before, with some of the, the scenes and the way that they did it. And then of course he is going to be the the last and final Passover lamb that sacrificed. And the nation of Israel, they are going to reject him. So we begin at verse 35, devoted. Jesus Christ is devoted to go to the cross. It says in verse 35, And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lack ye anything? Remember, remember when he sent them out? He sent out the 12 disciples, then he sent out the 70, and he told them to that don't take anything for your journey, but the, where, wherever you go, whatever house they receive you in, accept the hospitality and they'll take care of you. But now he's saying, they said, or they, he said, did you lack anything? They said, nothing. Verse 36, then said he unto them, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his script, take what you need. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. It was, uh, he was basically saying, take the things that you need. Of course, they're gonna take it to uh, the extreme. Oh, we need to go grab some swords. We're going to war. Of course, that's kind of what they wanted to do anyway. Sometimes you hear what you want to hear. For I say unto you that, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. Like when Jesus said that he was going to go to the cross, he's going to die, he's going to be buried, and he's going to rise again. That he's going to be uh, forsaken, he's going to be rejected, he's going to be forsaken, and he's going to be killed. And he's going to rise again the third day. They didn't really hear that. But they hear about the swords. I mean, they're going to say, let's go buy some swords. He's going to lead us against the Romans. <clears throat> How's, he going to do that? How's he going to do that if he's going to go, if he's going to die? Sometimes you just hear what you want to hear. Preconceived thought. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors for the thing concerning me have an end. It says that this, that is written, when Jesus says that something has been written, where was it written? In the New Testament? 
Jesus never preached out of the New Testament. He only preached out of the Old Testament. So when he says that it's that it has been written, he is referring to something that has been written in the Old Testament. And this particular verse is Isaiah 53, verse 12. It was reckoned among the transgressors. See, it's been written. It's been prophesied. He is going to fulfill what the Old Testament prophesied. And he is devoted to the task. And he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. The reason why I came to this earth is coming to fruition. What I what I came to do, I am going to do. He's going to die, he's going to be buried, and he's going to rise again, and then he's going to ascend into heaven. And he is going to say on the cross, it is finished. It has been completed. The reason why he came here. It will come, it will have an end. Redemption will be complete. So what did they say? Verse 38. You know, they could have said something. We're right behind you, Jesus. We know what why you came here. And and uh, we we will support you. We got your back. Rather they said, they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. Oh, look at how much swords we got. We're ready. You know, for ready. They don't get it. It's not a physical battle. They were not supporting him in what? In the spiritual battle he had to face. They wanted to support him in the physical battle. It's not what he wanted. I mean, we know what Peter's going to do, right? You already know what Peter's going to do. He's going to get rebuked too by Jesus. And it's kind of interesting because you think that Peter, he was ready to take that sword and fight. And yet later on he denies Jesus. You know, when Jesus was there, he, when, when, when Jesus is watching him, he's, what, is he trying to just score some points with Jesus in that way? And then when Jesus was not around, he could not even stand up to a servant woman. It's, it's interesting in what the things that they're going through. And sometimes it's interesting in the things that we may do when certain people are around or not around. Anyway. So we see that Jesus is devoted. We see in verse 39 through 46, darkness. This is going to be perhaps the darkest time that Jesus spent on this earth. One of the darkest times. Verse 39, and he came out and went as he as he went to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. So Jesus leaves the city. He celebrated the Passover and instituted the Lord's Supper. We looked at that last week. He, he spoke serious words to Peter. He told Peter, before the cock crows, thou shalt deny me thrice. And supposedly, during the Passover, or any of the, the, the feasts, you had the three uh, times of the year that you had these feasts that they would observe. Of course, three feasts were all connected in uh, with the Passover, unleavened bread, and the feast of the first fruits. Then you had the feast of Pentecost, and then you had the three fall feasts, where you had uh, the feast of trumpets, feast of uh, the, the day of atonement, and the feast of tabernacles. During these feasts, what I've heard is that they didn't they didn't allow roosters in the city because they made a lot of mess. And they, um, you know, I mean, if you have roosters around, and birds, roosters, you know. and also um, they would disrupt things by crowing and making noise, right? So they, they didn't allow them. They had a mandate out. Each rooster was fined $5,000. Wow. And they had a mandate. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and if they were to come, they had to wear masks and all that. They had to social distance and everything. Anyway, can I call a timeout right now or not? I'm not sure. <laughs> call it later. If it comes up, I have a comment or a question. So, but Jesus said to Peter before the cock crows, Thou shalt deny me thrice. And what is Peter? Not even. Hey, I'll. 
I will not deny you, even even if I have, even if it costs me my life, to the death I'll follow you, Jesus. Peter needs to be. Well, what hap- what's ne- what needs to happen to Peter for the Lord to use him in a great way? He needs to be humbled. Peter needs to be humbled. Guess what? If you're going to be used of God, you and you and I, we need to be humble. <coughs> Or for the Lord to use us, He's going to have to humble us. We have to be humbled. The Lord knows how to humble us. So Peter, he had he was arrogant. He was proud like a rooster, right? So roosters are proud, right? <laughs> <laughs> So here's Jesus. He observes the Lord, the, the, um, the Lord's Supper, the last Passover, the first Lord's Supper meal. He leaves the city. And as you're leaving Jerusalem, in fact, when you go to Jerusalem, sometimes the tour guide they'll stop on the, um, the other side, they're on the on the, they'll stop on the top of the Mount of Olives. It's not like a huge mountain, it's more like a kind of a, a hill in, in a way. And then there's a valley below it. And when you're looking at Jerusalem, and you're usually looking at the east side of the of, of the Temple Mount. So I guess you could say of the city, you're looking at that direction, and they'll take you there, and then they'll talk about the city, and then they'll you know, and you'll be looking at it, and you'll be taking pictures, take a group picture, and all that. I imagine that when Jesus left the city, he leaves. Oh, and that valley below is the Kidron Valley, and there's a brook, like a little creek, I guess, or a little river called the uh, Brook Kidron. And the name Kidron means darkness or obscurity. So he, he, he leaves the city where the temple is and, and, and all that, goes down, and if you're up there, you, you could have been like watching him leave the city and ascend up into the Mount of Olives. That's where this, this scene takes place. So he crosses over the Kidron Valley. And at that time, because there's there's... Josephus gives an estimate of numbers of how many people were in Jerusalem at the time. And because everyone came from all over the place, they weren't all able to stay in the city because there would be too many. During the feast days, the population of the city, because they're all the, the men were commanded to observe these feasts and they bring their families. So there were an estimate as high as two to three million people. And because of the amount of lambs that were slain, they have the number. During the time of Jesus' day, this particular Passover, there was 256,500 lambs that were slain. That's what so they figured that number is going to figure out to be that, that many people that were, that were there. Because you figure the families and, and all that. 256,500 lambs were slain. So as Jesus crosses over the Kidron Valley, and perhaps looks into the brook Kidron, it would have been completely blood red. It flowed with the blood of these Passover lambs. As they were slain in the temple, the blood left the temple as it was, the blood was shed and it was poured out and all of this blood was let out of the temple and flowed into the Kidron Valley and into the brook Kidron. So you could have looked there and seen that. And it was a reminder, or it was a message of the blood that he would shed. And as he goes through the Kidron Valley and looks at the brook, probably maybe even mentioned something about it. This was a dark time for Jesus Christ because of what he was about to face. He goes to from he goes after he crosses over the Kidron Valley, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. This is a place that if you go to Israel, guaranteed they'll take you there. There's different gardens. You don't know exactly where it was that Jesus prayed, but there's gardens all still till, till this day. There's all there's on the on that slope. There's gardens, and you go to the gardens. And the two different times I went to Israel, I went to two different gardens. And of course, you know that's your garden. It's, it's probably this garden that Jesus prayed at. <laughs> and then you go to the other one. Nah, I wasn't that garden. It was this garden? Because they want you to go to their garden, you know, but. <clears throat> He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. The word Gethsemane means oil press. And it's interesting that it's called that because this is where Jesus seems to have been pressed. And an oil, and, uh, and, uh, 
olive press. They have them in all over in Israel. Maybe you've seen one. But it's, there's like a big, huge round stone. Then there's another, like a triangular looking stone that just rolls around. And what it does is it smashes the, the olives. And it produces, and the first pressing of it is the most purest of, of the, um, the olive oil. And this olive oil is used for anointing, among other things that were used in ceremonial worship. So he goes into Gethsemane, which means oil press. And he is going to be pressed. So he is going to pray. Now, it says in uh, verse 39, And he came out and went, as he walked, to the mountain of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at that place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. There's a message in that. When you cross over into darkness, which is what Kidron means, the Kidron Valley. We know sometimes there's valley experiences in life, valleys of darkness. When you cross over into darkness, just like what Jesus says, pray. Because prayer will brighten it up. Verse 40. And when he was at that place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. A lot of people consider this that we're going through a dark valley. There have been people that lost loved ones. There have been people that have been very sick during the COVID-19 pandemic. There have been people that have lost jobs. There have been families that have been torn apart. There have been people that have been arguing. Glad I'm not like that. <laughs> Argue about people. I'm glad I'm not that opinionated. No, I am. But there have been a lot of disagreements. Okay, this is where I make the time out. You know why sometimes there's disagreements and confusion? Because we're told things from the media that contradicts itself and doesn't make sense. Doesn't that make your logical brain have a siren that goes off? That don't make sense. Illogical, illogical. For example, the... Um, moderator for the debates, Chris Matthews, after President Trump had, uh, and, and, and the First Lady Melania Trump had, had um, <coughs> caught the coronavirus, said, well, he caught the coronavirus because he's not wearing his mask. And I said to myself, <coughs> wait a minute. Didn't you say that when I wear a mask, it's to protect the other person, not myself. <laughs> Which is it? So, I thought, there's so much confusion out there that it's hard to not be, uh, have a difference of opinion. I think that's part of the plan, divide and conquer. So the best thing for us to do, to do as a body, as uh, the body of Christ, is to get along and not and respect each other's opinions because we're going to see things differently. And if you're not sure what is right, you give me a call I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then that way it'll, it'll be solved. <laughs> but I thought that was strange that he said that. If anything, he should have been critiquing himself perhaps. Maybe he didn't have a mask on. That's why he's you know, was part of the problem because he's not having a mask and not everyone else is not having a mask and all these people spread it to the president because the you know that's how you protect other people when you wear a mask is what I thought that's what because that's what's been said no you don't wear a mask for me if you don't wear a mask you're mean because you're going to affect me that's what I was, so why did the president why did Chris Matthews who's the moderator say that you know why I won't say why because I don't want to have a disagreement <laughs> but I just thought that was didn't make any sense that he publicly made that statement. Time in. <laughs> and as I say, Nate, thank you for letting me share. I feel a lot better now. <laughs> when you cross over into darkness, prayer will brighten things up. As you have a struggles with the coronavirus, whether it's a loss of income, loss of business, being sick, even the tragic loss of a loved one. We need to be praying. We need to be praying for our country. We need to be praying for one another. 
We need to be praying for the body of Christ. We need to be praying for our church, the people in our church that have not come back yet, or perhaps maybe some have gotten sick. I don't know of anyone, honestly, in our church that has gotten it, which, praise the Lord, I'm so thankful for that. Other churches have been through difficulties. The church that, that um, my daughter goes to, her and Fabian's church in um, Mission, Texas, they had several people die from the virus. And um, other churches on this island, church across the street, we need, to be praying, we need to be praying for one another. We need to be praying during this time for our country. We need to pray for our president and our first lady. We need to be praying for our elected officials in our state. Prayer will brighten it up. People get depressed, right, during the virus, mandates, rules, and things. And so what? What is the answer? Prayer. Pra prayer will brighten things up in a dark valley. That's what he's saying. He tells them to pray. Prayer will provide strength and protection during the darkest of times. Sometimes the, the protection we need is from our own thoughts. We can think some pretty dark things. We're not careful. He says, pray. Pray that he enter not into temptation. Verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but, thy, but thine be done. I see differences of opinions. I'm not going to pretend to know the answer to this one. But is this the cup, the cup of redemption or the cup of judgment? Him being the Passover lamb that will pay the price for sin. So, or the cup of judgment that he's saying that if I need to, because the wrath of God is going to be placed upon him. Either case, maybe it's the cup of judgment. I don't know what he's referring to. But he's saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. This phrase has been the subject of a lot of controversy between people. Why did he pray that? Did he not want to go? I mean, is just this to show his humanity? In fact, that he just didn't want to go to the cross or he was afraid at this time? What? Why did? I don't believe that at all. Jesus already knew from the end... From, he knew the end from the beginning. The Bible says that he was in the beginning with God from the beginning of eternity. There's never been a time where Jesus Christ never was. He's, he, he's eternal. He is God in the flesh. In fact, there's never been a time where anything um, surprised him. He's all-knowing, just like God. Now, he did have some, he did impose some self-limitations upon himself being in the flesh. He had to walk to go from point A to point B. He had to eat. He hungered. Obviously, he bled. But I don't believe here he's trying to get out of it. I believe there's an important message he's giving out. Amen. He's saying, Father, listen to his words. If thou be willing, remove this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. If this is the cup of redemption or judgment, he is referring obviously to salvation and how salvation is going to be purchased. If there is any other way, if there's any other way that man can be saved other than me going to the cross, remove it. Let the other way be done. And obviously, God did not remove it, right? That's right. He's asking the Lord, not my will. Thy will be done. What is the message? There's no other way that you can be saved other than through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Only by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ can you be saved. That's why he says this. There's going to be things that Jesus says on the cross that causes people to be confused. Well, why is he saying this? So we will know what's happening. For example, when he says... Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Was he on the cross confused that, wow, why, where's God? Why is this happening? No, he's letting us know that the transaction is taking place. Because you and I were what? Separated from God. And so he is now being separated so you and I can be reconciled. He's paying the price. Sin is coming upon him. And righteousness is being offered to us. That's right. So how would you and I know that that was happening other than he uttered those words? That's 
just like here. He's uttering these words here. And also, by the way, he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's the first time he referred to his heavenly father as God. Did you know that God is a title for God? Don't always refer to God in your prayers as God. Refer to him as the Lord. Refer to him as Jesus Christ. You can refer to him as Heavenly Father. But if you always say God, that, that doesn't offend the Muslims, by the way. You can give a testimony and talk about how God changed your life. That does not offend people in the least. But when you say Jesus Christ, skin crawls on the people that don't believe in Jesus. That's why the Bible says, in the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow and tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's all about Jesus. When you say the name of Jesus, that you can see the change in the countenance of believers and unbelievers. Believers, unbelievers, <laughs> see it. Just speak the name of Jesus. Why do you think on TV when they curse, they say Jesus' name in vain? I know they say God's name in vain. They say the title of God's name in vain. But they say Jesus' name in vain. Why? Why don't they say the devil? Oh, devil this, devil that. Because the devil knows. They're speaking out against the name above all names. So he's, re he's referring to the, the cup of redemption, the cup of judgment. He's saying in, when it, in, in reference to salvation, if there's any other way, then let it happen. But he goes to the cross. Why? Because that was just one of the ways? You know, maybe some people want to receive Jesus to get saved rather than earn it. No, he's saying, there's no way. There's no other name given among men, uh, among men whereby we must be saved. There's no... Jesus said that there's no other way to the Father but by me. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's no way to heaven other than by receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you think you can earn your way to, to heaven, then you are going to be sadly mistaken in the day of judgment. You cannot earn your way to heaven. If you've sinned one time, you cannot make it to heaven. If you've sinned one, if you told one lie, and I, would, I, I don't think anyone in here would say to themselves or to anybody, I've never lied before. Ooh. The Bible says in James chapter 1, or James 2, verse 10, if anyone offends the law at one point, he's guilty of it all. There's no way you can make it to heaven. And it's not a combination between what you do and what Jesus did. It's 100% Jesus. The only thing we offer Him is our sin. That's what qualifies us. Because if we don't believe that we're sinners, we don't believe that we're separated from God, then we're not going to see the need to receive Jesus Christ. Although we are all separated from God. It says in John chapter 10, verse 1 through 2, 1 and 2, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep can't get in other in any other way. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 through 4 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, that's the good news, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you, you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's the gospel. That's the definition of the gospel right there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4, particularly verse 3 and 4. So Jesus gives us a message there, telling us that the only way to heaven is by receiving him into our life. He had to go to the cross. There was no other way. The second thing about this prayer, he says, not my will, but thine be done. This is how we should pray. Not my will, but thy will be done. What do you want to do in your life? The will of God. When we pray, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Lord, I really want to get into a relationship with this person, but not my will, thy will be done. 
You know Israel, when they asked for a king, even though it wasn't a time for it, God gave them the king because they wanted, they, they pleaded with him. Rather than saying, Lord, we want a king, but if it's not, you know, if it's not right, if it's not the right timing, then your will will be done. He said, okay, yeah, wait. But when we insist, 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 sometimes the Lord will give us that which we ask him for, and it could be the worst thing for us. I'm very thankful for, for the prayers that I prayed where the Lord said, no. That was more important sometimes than any of the prayers that he said yes. Lord, I would like to marry this person. No. Oh, thank the Lord. The answer was no. Because I got to marry Roxanne. See? Pray that the Lord's will will be done. This is another way to pray. Not thy will, but my will be done. Do you know? It's e either or. Your will or my will. And sometimes that's our biggest problem right there. We want to do our will. Not your will, but my will be done. By the way, the Lord will answer both of those. He will hear them and answer them. We need to be careful on how we pray. Do we want the Lord's will or we just want to do what we want to do? The world says, hey, just do what you want to do. That's the best way to live, man. You're free. Free to do what you want. Really? Is that the best way to live? No. The best way to live is to do what He wants. That, and by the way, that's freedom. To do the freedom to do what he wants. So his important prayer in the garden. It says in verse 43, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. He was being pressed in Gethsemane. But an angel was strengthening him. Do you know that we have guardian angels? An angel was, this is another verse that people scratch their head and think, an angel was strengthened. Remember, he is 100% human. And he needed physical strength to get through this. This was a very difficult time for Jesus Christ as he prayed in the garden. He was being pressed. And there was an angel strengthening him. But you know what? I don't think we could all say or maybe be confident in knowing how all the spiritual how spiritual battle works. But when we read the, the scriptures and we see different passages, it seems to be that the angels strengthen Jesus and the angels can strengthen us. But it also seems that our prayers strengthens the angels. Now, if I'm wrong on that, you can, you can help me out. But I, that's why I see it and that's what it seems to be. That our prayers strengthens the angels. And it could it be that some of our angels are. <laughs> I'm so tired. How much angel can bench press the bar? <laughs> One time only. <laughs> I don't know how it all works, but it is interesting when Daniel prayed that the angel came to him and there was a battle. Remember that? How many don't remember it? Okay, good, because we're going to read it right now. Daniel chapter 10, verse 12 through 14. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel. This is the angel talking. For from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to Chasing thyself before God as Daniel prayed his beautiful prayer. Thy words were heard. Isn't that, a, isn't that an encouragement? That God hears our prayers, our words are heard. Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. God hears our prayer, send his angel. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, that's a demon, withstood me one in twenty days. That's twenty-one days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Reinforcements, because of Daniel's prayer, perhaps. Came to help me, and I remained there with the king of Persia. And now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in, in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. 
That's spiritual battle right there, spiritual warfare. And it had a lot to do with Daniel's prayers. Does that make you want to pray more? Saturday, 10 o'clock, prayer meeting. A.M. I know sometimes some people come 10, 10 p.m. But 10 a.m. And then before church on Sunday, 8.30 a.m. Spiritual battle. Spiritual warfare. And the angel, the angel strengthened him. Verse 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Another verse that's been highly disagreed upon and disputed. Was this really blood? Or was it just sweat that was as blood? I say this is blood. The reason I say that is because why didn't it just say sweat? Why did it say sweat as blood? And we know that that word as can be, be a reference to that this is blood in the way it's worded. His sweat, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. But I can also see why this is blood because, and why it says sweat. Because some people say, well, why does it say sweat? Because there was another garden long time before this that Adam was in. And he sinned in this garden, the Garden of Eden. Eden meaning pleasant. It was in this pleasant garden. He's in a pressing, I mean, He's in a Gethsemane being pressed. And Adam was in a pleasant garden and he sinned. And as a result of the sin, mankind was cursed. And part of the curse was that in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread. So now here's Jesus Christ, the second Adam. So Adam is the first Adam. There was no Adams before Adam. Only the I guess there was the Adam. But he's Adam. The first Adam. Never had one Adam before Adam. Jesus is the second Adam. Why second Adam? Have plenty of Adams. No. Because Adam is the son of God. With a little s, son of God. Because he was created by God. Jesus Christ is God. He is God's son. So he is capital S, son of God. He is the second Adam. He had to undo what Adam did. See, Adam came into this world. God created him and told him, don't sin. And he sinned. So now we inherited that sin. The Bible says, for as by one man, Adam, sin came into the world. And death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Now the second Adam has to undo that. So look at some verses. Well, let me read this quote by Clark. There have been cases in which persons in debilitated state of body or through horror of soul have had their sweat tingled with blood. Cases sometimes happen in which through mental pressure the pores may be so dilated that the blood may issue from them so that there may be a bloody sweat. I forget what the medical word for that is. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45 through 47, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. That's Jesus Christ. Howbeit that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So when Adam ate of the forbidden fruit, part of the curse was in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread. So now Jesus Christ is agonizing in this garden, being pressed. And that sweat that's coming down is becoming blood as a picture of what he has to do in order to undo that curse. He's going to have to shed his blood. And this is like a message, a picture of what was going to happen. And Jesus is agonizing in his soul, so much so that he bleeds drops of blood. You know, if you have pressure, and we all do, but not like this. I never did sweat blood. 
I saw it one time kind of in this kind of similar. I saw it. I don't know if it's exactly this, but you can ask me about that later if you want. I saw this before. I don't want to say who it was or what. But I saw someone do that. But I've never did it myself. It says in Hebrews 12, verse 1 through 4, Wherefore, seeing we are so compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. This, is, this that Jesus is going through is difficult because we need to know it's difficult of what he went through. But because of the prize that he had his eyes set on, it was, not, it was no problem. Because of what he had his eyes set. You know what his joy that he set his eyes on? You know what that joy is? You and me. The joy that was set before him endured the cross. Despised the shame. We're going to see that at the end of this chapter. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And the Bible says, consider him. Look at it. Verse 3 on the notes. Hebrews 12. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. For ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You've not resisted. Think about this. Jesus Christ was, as all points, tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So, for you and I to be tempted and to give in, then that means it's, the pressure is mounting, you give in, the pressure is gone, right? You gave in to the sin, of course not sin equals death, uh, after sin is death. Jesus never gave in. So the pressure was mounting and mounting, and he never gave in. He never gave in to the fullest extent of the most extreme temptation. And he never gave in. He resisted until blood came off, off, of, his, off of his hand. And he was straightened by the angels because of his prayers. Verse 45. See, he's giving us a message on how to live, how to pray. He's giving us a theological definition of salvation. Or the gospel. Verse 45. And when he arose from prayer, and he was come to his disciples. So this is where I get in. This is where, this is where I, I can relate to the story. When he arose from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. What was they doing? He was agonizing in prayer. What were they doing? Sleeping. And said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. So what are the disciples doing? Sleeping. When we're praying at 8.30, what were you doing? Were you sleeping? Whoa. Yeah. At 10 o'clock, were you at work or were you, at, were you sleeping when we were praying? I don't much more. There's sometimes I'm, Brother Mills can tell you this, a lot of times we be in prayer meetings, and it be my turn to pray. No one's praying. We look over. He's coming up praying. Because he's sleeping. <laughs> it's always happened to me. You go and you pray, right? Everyone taking lost my time, gets you all fast already. Remember all night prayer meetings? How many times that happened, right? We have all night prayer meetings. Like, uh, you know when you do it a circle and everyone's going to take turns? Yeah. You ever been there? You've been tired at 3 a.m. or right in a prayer meeting. You're like, don't fall asleep. Don't fall asleep. And it makes you go, so take, take your turn. <laughs> Ever happened to you? Yeah. Sometimes we can be weak. I know I can be. Jesus is praying so intensely. I mean, he is battling in prayer. He's being strengthened by the angels through his prayers and he, he, is, he is facing sin head on in, in a message about what he's about to do. And his disciples are just, just out cold. They sit playing video games. They don't make shooting sounds anymore at video games before you should be space invaders. Or Pac-Man. Different sounds nowadays. The, the video games nowadays are so easy. Ours was hard. <laughs> That's why I don't play them too easy. I don't get involved. <laughs> chasing around people. I don't know what they're doing. It's shooting people, chasing around little goals. I don't know. It's so, it's so easy. I don't play them. Ours was hard. 
Peace and be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow, those things go so fast. Yeah, gotta be good. They hit that thing like a <laughs> asteroids, all these rocks coming at you. <laughs> Lots. You guys got it easy. <laughs> we actually had to put quarters in these things. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> You guys, you didn't have quarters. You didn't even know what credits are. <laughs> it's never did string quarters, yeah? You know what I mean? <laughs> I bet you did. You string quarters. <laughs> you're the whole, yeah? <laughs> Castle Park. Oh, you were. <laughs> Remember when Miss Pac Man came out? Oh, we woke up early, caught the boss. Oh, it's me. Miss Pac Man, we should got our little string quarter, drill hole, AirPods. <laughs> he was living it up back then. <laughs> I said, they don't pay quarters for nothing on these. I thought, oh, and man, when our kids grow up, man, they're going to have to pay like $5 to play in video games. Hey, 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 this thing goes on forever. They don't even have scores now. <laughs> so easy, I said. <laughs> anyway, moving on. <laughs> Detaining, now the arrest. Oh, by the way, I want to read this, this, um, this line here. Sleeping instead of praying or falling asleep spiritually can be one of our worst problems. Asleep spiritually, so much is going on, and yet what are we doing? We need to, we need to be awake, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Do, we need to be doing something that's profitable and not a waste of time. By the way, prayer is never a waste of time. Worship is never a waste of time. Winning souls is never a waste of time. Do we have examples of wastes of time? Anyone want to give an example? No one gives what theirs is, but other people's are. <laughs> no, we don't want to say it yet. That's okay. Let's just talk about all the ones that people on, on the live stream are doing wrong. <laughs> By the way, watching football is really not a waste of time. And I'll explain why. <laughs> but don't come in any scores. <laughs> Detaining, this is the arrest. And while he ate spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. And Jesus said unto him, Judas, betray, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? And when they were, and when they which were about him saw, saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them, Luke must have been Peter's friend, yeah. <laughs> Peter might have said to Luke, I don't put my name on. Huh? Don't put my name. Do you know who wrote um, Mark's gospel? John Mark. John Mark writes his gospel on behalf of Peter. And I don't believe that Peter's name is in there either. Because Peter said, Are hey, you writing this from my perspective, right? Don't put my name. Matthew. Matthew, I don't think Matthew has his name either. Who put his name? John, years later, puts his name in it. I'm going to put Peter's name. So who was this? Peter. And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. Can you imagine how that Roman soldier felt? His ear gets cut off and then he gets put back on and healed. And I bet he could hear better in that in that ear than the other ear. <laughs> wow, this ear is worth good now. <laughs> they cut this one off too. <laughs> one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his the servant of the high priest. And by the way, the servant of the high priest was usually a young person, like maybe some say even a teenager or young twenties. That's why Peter did. They say that's why Peter went after him. He's young, right? I don't know. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched and he, his ear and healed him. Then, then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, Be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves. When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. He says, my hour was not yet come. And the reason why you can do this as being your hour is because this is what God allows. This is all controlled by God. 
God is in control. By the way, during this pandemic, he's still in control. The election that's about to take place, he's in control of that too. John 18, 10 through 11. So John gives you the information right here. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. In heaven, Peter probably said to John, Well, why do you have to put my name for him? Why are you throwing me another bus? Why are you rat me out? <laughs> Everybody knows now. Then said, I cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. He even puts Mal the Malchus name in there. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into thy sheath. The cup which my father giveth me, shall I not drink it? In Matthew 26, verse 51 and 52, this is Matthew's account. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. What is he saying? He said, put away your sword, Peter. You want to live like that? You want to live a violent life? You want to live by the sword? Well, you will perish with the sword. You want to be violent? Violence is going to come upon you. You reap what you sow. Judas was being betrayed. Judas betraying Jesus was a kiss that was prophesied in Psalms chapter 2, if you want to read that. It's a little hard to understand it as far as how it's a prophecy of, of um, Judas betraying Jesus Christ, but you can see it in there if you read Psalms chapter 2. Last thing, or two more things quickly, denial. Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter, Peter sat down among them. So the rest of the disciples fled. Peter followed at a distance, hoping to prove wrong what Jesus said about being denied, forsaken, and put to death. And there are other trials that are not mentioned in this account, but the trials were held at night, which is illegal, for one thing, for them to assemble at night. Peter fo followed afar off. He didn't want to be noticed. Verse 56, But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire. It's interesting how he was trying to warm himself up by the fire and Jesus was sweating in the garden. Because of his prayers, he became so warm. And earnestly looked upon him and said, This man also, this man also was with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after another con uh, confidently affirmed saying of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he spake, while he had spake, the cock crew. And he realized that he denied Jesus Christ three times. And another account said that he began to curse and swear, calling down curses from heaven upon, upon himself. And they knew that that's not a follower of Jesus. A couple things about this. He denied, saying, I know him not. I don't know Jesus. And then he denied, saying, I know them not. He said, thou art also of them. And he said, I am not. I'm not of them. I don't know Jesus, and I'm not a part of them, the disciples. Because that's two aspects of being a Christian, is that we know Jesus Christ, and we associate with followers of Jesus in the fellowship. So, a Christian, people are going to know that we are Christians because we have a relationship with Jesus Christ and we have a relationship with other Christians. That's what a Christian does. So when, when Peter said, I don't know Jesus and I, and I am not a part of his followers, he's denying what it is to be a Christian. So what does that tell you and me? That we ought to have a good relationship with Jesus. We also ought to have a good relationship with other Christians. That's what Christianity is all about. By the way, you cannot worship, uh, you cannot uh, have fellowship with the congregation of the church when you're at home. That's why we need to be together. Don't you think that this is something that the devil has not planned for this pandemic? This is a pandemic. And the devil's behind a lot of this, where what he's trying to do is separate people, relationships, keep people out of church. 
and feed them a line that is not safe. There's going to be arguments, what's safer, a grocery store or a church? And I would tell you this, that there's a whole lot more people that sometimes you don't know who it is, could be some of the most filthy filthiest people that go there, that go to the restroom, don't wash their hands, and they're really, really dirty, 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 touching everything in that store. And people say it's totally safe to go to the grocery store, it's totally safe to go to the gas station, it's totally safe to go to work, it's totally safe to do this and that, and this and a hundred things, but it's not safe to go to church. Mm. I beg to differ. It's important spiritually to go to church. And people are being depressed, and people are having struggles, and they're not being encouraged because they're bought into that line. Now, if you're sick, stay home. But don't try to say, I'm going to get you sick when I am not sick. That's a medical mystery to me. It is fairy tale land. Amen. In my opinion. Gotta say my opinion because I'm not a medical professional or specialist. So, in my opinion, in my non medical profession, but you know what tell me biblically how you can stand on that tell me biblically how when there are people that risk their lives to come to church knowing that they may even die if they go and still win or we're hiding out because of a I think a paper tiger virus at times again that's just my opinion it's my opinion I'm not trying to make light of those that have got sick, but neither should people make light of the people that have gotten sick of the flu before. And I don't think we hit out in basements for flus before, which is, in my opinion, lots of opinions today, just as deadly. I got a little bit of facts on that last point, though. A little bit, a little bit of facts. If you want to argue with me, then don't, don't bother, because I don't really want to argue. <laughs> Don't send me a text message or a Facebook post, please. <laughs> you do, I'll give you I'll call it both. So we can talk as civilized, loving brothers in Christ. Or brother, sister in Christ. Me being brother, you being sister here. Okay. <laughs> Denial. Illegal trial. The cop crew three. You know what's another interesting thing about this? You know how that they knew Jesus was well, how they how Jesus proved to them that he was not a believer by the way he talked. How do you know someone's from Hawaii or not? Pigeon. They could look Hawaiian, they could be Hawaiian. But if they don't talk pigeon, they weren't born and raised here. If they don't have a pigeon accent, you can tell just by the way they talk. And people that fake the pigeon accent, you can detect that. <laughs> don't, sound right. don't fake it by the way just, don't worry about it. just talk with the southern draw it's fun to, to listen to that too you can also have someone who is very fair complected very 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 fair complected but they talk heavy pigeon you know they're from here the way you and I talk gives you away more than the way you look that's how they're going to know we're a Christian not because I carry around a Bible, not because I look a certain way on the outskirts, on the outside, but how do I talk? Do I say all the F words? Do I say all the bad language? Do I gossip? Do I run people down? The Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to use to edify that it may minister grace to the hearers. I think there are sometimes people that are frauds. Why? You can tell because what comes out of their mouth. Because what comes out of their mouth is what's in the heart. So what do we got to do? We can't tame our tongue. What do we got to do? We got to tame the heart. Then we'll speak out. Hey, we're going to have bad days. Don't get me wrong. The other day I said, stupid head. But it was to a dog. You know, once in a while I'll say something wrong. No, I didn't say that. No, I don't want to give myself away. No, we can, we can have bad days. We can say things we shouldn't. But we ought to get it right, right? We ought to, you know, I think but we as believers, we ought to have a, we ought to speak right. We ought to speak right. We shouldn't be going around saying all kind of bad words and hateful things and mean things. We should be nice. We should be kind. 
and that'll tell you how, how we really are. And we're going to fail at that, but when we are, we ought to work on our heart. Because the Bible says a tongue can no man tame. We can't control it. We can only control the heart, right? Moving on. Too much conviction going on right here. Right now. Out here, not up here. <laughs> in there, in there, the phone. Almost done. Verse 63, and the Lord. Oh, this is. This is, a, this is a hard one for Peter. Not, not, not that Peter. This is Peter, Apostle Peter. It's a hard one, man. And after a little while, verse 58, while well, another saw him and said, I'll read that, right? Verse 60, and Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he had spake, the cock crew. And look at the next verse, verse 61. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. All what Jesus was going through, Peter is falling from a ways off. You ever, ever had that where you kind of looked at someone and you had eye contact and you both knew that you looked at each other for whatever reason? Whether it was to say, what, what, like scrap. <laughs> or when, you know, a guy is looking at one wahini and, or a vice versa and they meet eyes and 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 uh, the guy's saying, oh, she saw me looking at her. It might have just have been a um, coincidence, but their eyes met. Well, here, Peter knew that Jesus looked at him and why. Can you imagine how he felt when they locked eyes? Well, we know it hit Peter hard. So the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. He had to be humbled. He had to be humbled. Do you know that he never after this denied Jesus again? He stood before the Sanhedrin and he told them that he crucified Jesus who rose from the dead. And there came a day where he was about to be put to death and he was in the jail cell. About to be put to death the next day. They couldn't do it because of the, pass that, the Passover feast. They had to wait. And while he was in his cell, about to be executed, he was stressing out. No. He was sleeping. Yep. Hey, wake me up when it's time to die, okay? Yeah, I'm taking a nap. Why? Because he wanted to be with Jesus. He couldn't wait. He didn't care. He would. He never denied Christ. He learned. He was humbled. And he had to, because he denied Christ three times, Jesus made him publicly confess him three times that he loved him. And he said, what? Feed my sheep. Last section, real fast, disdain. 63 to 71. And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is that that smote thee? And many other things blasphemously spake they against him. And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him into their council, saying, Are thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer me, nor let me go. Sometimes I think that's the way the president should answer questions. Why are you going to ask? Can I ask? You said at one sheriff when they asked him the question. So you think it? it you think it's uh, wrong? Like if President Trump came here, would he have to wear a mask? I am not going to answer your question. Are there any other questions you want to ask me that I'm not going to want to answer? <laughs> you guys heard that? That's funny. <laughs> Think sometimes that's how the questions are. If Jesus is saying here, there's no sense that I answer your que your questions. In fact, if we're if, if I was gonna if you're gonna ask me questions and I was gonna answer, were you gonna allow? Were you gonna hear it out? Were you gonna let me go free, as, as if you could see if I was innocent? No. So he said, I'm not even gonna answer. And he doesn't. Verse 69. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. They said. Then said they all, Are thou then the Son of God? And he answered unto them, Ye say that I am. We need, what need we any further witnesses? For we ourselves have heard of his own mouth. And he answered in the affirmative in a way, because he said, Ye say that I am, not denying it. And that's all he said. 
Though Jesus was abused, mocked, and ridiculed, he did not retaliate. Imagine how hard that would be. Imagine how hard it is for us. Sometimes we, we kind of just do that when someone drives a little strange near us. <laughs> you have someone drive a little strange and you got to kind of like retaliate in some way. Break check them or something, you know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. First Peter 2, 21 through 23. For even here too were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Yeah. What did Jesus do? He committed himself to the Lord. He said to Father. That's what he wants us to do. The only accusation they could make was Jesus' reply to their question as to whether he, he was or not the Son of God. Paying the price on the way to the cross. One more chapter and we'll see Jesus Christ pay the price for our sin on the cross. He paid the price so that we could go free. You know what that means? He purchased us. You know what that means? We belong to Him. We belong to Him. We are not our own, the Bible says. We're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Whatsoever we uh, eat or drink, or whatsoever we do, the Bible says, do all to the glory of God. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Heads bowed and eyes closed.